Welcome to the untold stories behind the Hyperledger community, a monthly podcast in which we invite contributors from across the Hyperledger ecosystem to share about why they're using Hyperledger projects and why they're actively involved in this community. While there are lots of venues to learn about the what of Hyperledger technologies, this show is focused on why individuals roll up their sleeves to help develop and deploy them. Each episode features an in-depth discussion with guests who are helping to shape the future of enterprise blockchain and their journey as leaders, developers, and open source contributors. Conversations will delve into topics such as why they got involved with Hyperledger, why they're excited about the technology, and how they deal with the challenges involved in contributing to a large global open source community. My name is Sean Bohan, and I'm a community architect for the Hyperledger Foundation. Today, I'm speaking with Kareem stick Hillenberg and Baron Sledrek, contributors to the Hyperledger community for several years, specifically on Aries, and definitely on Aries Framework JavaScript, which is our topic today. Welcome to you both. Um, starting with Kareem, would each of you mind introducing yourself, where you work, um, both you know the company and the location, and what you work on here at Hyperledger? Sure. Um, well, thank you, Sean. Uh, I'm Karim Stecklenberg. Um, I'm co-founder and um, engineer at um, at Anima Solutions. Um, we are a, uh, a well, a I, I guess SSI startup based in uh, Utrecht, the Netherlands. Um, we have a small team of around ten people, and um, we work mainly on Hyperledger, um, Aries Framework JavaScript. Um, I think it's safe to say that we are the uh, largest contributor to the project, um, and we've done so for a few years. Baron. Hi, I'm uh, Baron Sliedrecht. I work for Animo, um, started there with an internship once, uh, helping AFJ, and I did that under supervision of Karim. Uh, I think that was about two years ago now. And from that point on, just kept working at Animo, kept working on AFJ, uh, I've been involved in the Irish community ever since. Outstanding. And thank you for joining us today to talk about the work you're doing on AFJ. Aries Framework JavaScript, I keep going AFJ, I, I have to say that the whole thing. Um, but before we get into AFJ and the work you're doing, let's answer a couple of questions about you both. Um, starting with Baron, when did you first get interested in software engineering? Like, what was the thing where you went, I want to do that? Um, I think that was like, I wasn't not specifically software engineering, I guess, but I think when I was in primary school somewhere, um, my dad got me a computer, which only gave a blue screen and nothing else it didn't do anything. And it was amazing to me. And I had a remote control and again, it didn't do anything. And I love the buttons. And I think from that point on, it, it was something to do with computers and then I have software engineering, making stuff uh, with computers. It, it seemed like a quite natural uh, fit for me. Awesome. It's a bit of the background. <laughs> uh, Kareem, what got you started down this road? Man, I wish I had an exciting story <laughs> like Baird has. No, um, well, I, I don't know. As a, as a teenager and student, uh, I had quite a messy period, I guess. I didn't know what to do <laughs> at all. So at some point I did... The hotel school and uh, after that i started working in uh, well in uh, in restaurants and cafe in the kitchens and after a year i realized this is not what i want so um then i sort of randomly picked from a long list of um of studies you could do uh, and i ended up in electrical engineering um started doing that um, um was terrible at the mathematics but did discover um software engineering there and that i was actually quite good at it um which uh, frustrates my mom because my mom is a software engineer as well and she has all my life she has told me you should do this and i already said no um yeah so it sure. comes around it's work around but anyway um that is uh, uh yeah so through electrical engineering i discovered software awesome so kareem do you remember the first open source project you used so uh, the first oh well i multiple i think um probably because through my electrical engineering um um a year of, uh, in my studies i i worked with arduino i don't know if that is a, yeah. a uh, known to everyone but it's a, like an open source hardware project uh, that also comes with uh, with like a c++ library um and uh yeah i think that's probably the first one maybe open frameworks is another c++ framework for weird 
art installations, visual stuff. Um, but I, I think those one of those two must be the first one. Yeah. Very cool. And Baron, what was the first uh, open source uh, project or product that you used? Um, well, I mean, I, I, I knew that I wanted to do something with computers from very early on, but I was uh, uh, quite a lazy uh, kid in high school. So the first project I probably used was Python in uh, the start of college. Uh, I didn't do anything before that. Was just waiting to go to college and then start doing it from there. Um, awesome. Yeah. I was expecting Firefox, and you guys, you know, you you you, you went totally hard. Internet point. Explorer. <laughs> I Netscape Navigator. <laughs> um, so I, I guess turning over to Baron, what was the first open source software community you participated in, where you were a contributor or even just you know working on it? Airstream JavaScript, uh, yeah, clear and simple. <laughs> That's the start. Awesome, and it was your internship uh, with Animo, obviously. Uh, yeah. Kareem, what was your first open source community that you participated in and contributed to? So my my answer is not too different from that of Baron, but uh, for me it was Akapai um, because we actually um, uh, I met uh, my other co-founders in university as well, um, and we got into the whole SSI space because of a, of a university project um, that was, uh, uh, yeah, we were building with uh, Aries Cloud Agent Python. Um, so from there, we at some point progressed to Aries Framework JavaScript. But Out, Outstanding. Um, I don't really need to ask the next question because you just both explained what motivated you to, to go from being a user to actually being active in the community and, and contributing. But I want to back up for a second and talk a little bit about Hyperledger and then a little bit about blockchain and get into what you're doing with Aries Framework JavaScript. But um, you're both maintainers in the AFJ community. Um, what's the role of a maintainer? What Within the uh, an open source community of contributors and some contributors are contributing code, some people are, are, are uh, doing bug fixes, some people are writing documentation. What does the maintainer do in a community? So for, for us, it has mainly been everything, actually. Um, we've been, uh, yeah, we've been scrolling through the issues, helping people there. Um, we've been in the Discord. Uh, there are always, there are always issues. There's always something going on with people needing help to, to, to get started. Um, mainly, um, also, of course, been maintaining the framework we've been programming in it we've been adding features uh out of like personal interest out of like for clients that need a specific feature and we've been adding it to the framework um a big part of it is also the working group calls hosting it getting a bit of a discussion going um taking in everyone's opinion and then yeah, deciding what's best for the framework and not like only what what you and your clients want um and I think finding a bit of a balance between that um, and now with the helping helping with issues, it's important that people can get started uh, fairly easily. Uh, so we've, we've been spending quite a bit of time uh, on that part. So we, we don't actually have to help everyone because it's supposed to just work, um, which is, has been one of our main goals with, with AFJ that it just works, um, which it's been going quite well. We've gotten quite a bit of compliments about it, but I mean, we're, we're still running into some like build issues, of course. <laughs> and uh, Kareem, if a developer, so someone, not, not someone who thinks they want to become a developer or is just starting out, but a developer wants to start contributing to open source, where would you suggest they start? Like what's, what would be the rabbit hole you would recommend to them? Open source in general, or is open that... source in general? Hey, I want to get involved in a project. How do I? What's like the best yeah. starting point? So um, this counts definitely counts for 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 every time JavaScript, but um, I I think for most open source projects I've been well not working on actively, but a little bit involved in. Um, I mean, GitHub definitely is the place to be for uh, when it comes to source code and and version management. Um, Everything is on GitHub. Uh, well, no, not everything. There is also GitLab and and other things. But I mean, I think the the majority of of serious open source projects uh, live on GitHub. So that's that's I think the first place um, to go and to check out the project. Um, 
then uh, a lot of these communities also have a Discord, uh, Discord channel or Discord um, a server where you can ask questions and usually uh, can talk to um, well, yeah, the maintainers or the, the the contributors to the project. This is exactly what we do um, in every stream of JavaScript as well. Um, and then I, and then I think um, uh, from there it, it really probably depends on the the particular project um we have a working group calls because this is not just an open source project made by one person but really a hyperledger community driven uh project so so we have to coordinate so we have bi-weekly calls um uh, on thursdays where we discuss uh contributions issues uh, prs that, that kind of stuff um yeah but i think those first do like look look for channels where to where to chat about the project and yeah, go go on to GitHub, uh, read issues, comment on issues, uh, get into that. Awesome, thank you. Um, let's get into the most important thing: identity. Um, Baron, what is decentralized? What is your definition of decentralized identity? Do you mind if I hand this over to Kareem? No, I don't mind at all. Kareem, it's up to you. What What is decentralized identity to you, Kareem? Um, not centralized identity, but that's a that's a very bad answer. No, um, good so answer. I'll try to make this short because I am always way too lengthy in my work. But um, so 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 classically, digital identity um, um, lives in what we call silos. Um, if you look at physical identity like passports, you get a passport. That's a physical document you get, you carry with you, um, you control it. You decide who you show it to and 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 who not to show it to. And um, with digital identity or, or digital information in general, is easily modified, copied, um, uh, exchanged, etc. So that same model is way harder to to achieve. Um, because if you look at, for instance, a passport, it has kind of it has security features. That's what we call them. Those are the the little shiny things on your passport and the weird figures in the background, those security features are 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 there to make it very hard to uh, reproduce or to um, um, counterfeit. And uh, that in digital or in digital with digital information, um, uh, yeah, doesn't really exist normally. So we ended up in in the digital world to say, you know what, we're we're not going to do we're not going to use that same model. Instead. Um, we will <clears throat> rely on other trusted parties to store that information for us. So if I need to uh, online, if, if I'm an entity and I want to know uh, something about someone, um, let's say uh, uh, I want to know your uh, birth date, whatever, um, then I would reach out to a party I trust um, that has already done a know your customer process, KYC process, that's what we call it, um, for you. So for instance, a bank uh, usually has a, a pretty thorough verification process before you can enroll or open a bank account in that bank. So they do a certain verification process. And um, because um, that uh, decentralized nature, which we, can, which we see in physical identity, is so hard to reproduce uh, digitally, um these um uh, yeah these banks offer services kyc services where they can tell but basically other people ask hey can you give me some information about this or is this information true about this person and they assert yes or no so um the problem of that is um in the end a lot of data of a lot of different people and users is locked into a database a silo as we call that so it's all together um the trouble of that is is you have a well a big treasure trove of information uh, which makes it interesting for hackers um but also uh, the data that is about you now lives somewhere else in a um, environment that is not under your control and um i think that that is a um yeah, that's a, a a problem that that became evident when you look at at like scandals um, like uh, Cambridge Analytica, and and there are many more where you don't have control over the data that is about you. So, what is decentralized identity? It is basically a, a philosophy or model um, to bring these these security features we have in 
physical identities, so the, the shiny things I talked about when passports, to bring that to the digital world. Um, and that is done by um, uh, the use of, of heavy use of cryptography and uh, cryptographic signatures and all kinds of other magic I don't fully understand mathematically. But um, so uh, I think that is it in a nutshell. Um, no, that, that, that's a great answer. Uh, but so you laid out a, a pretty interesting case for decentralized identity in the enterprise and, and hyperledger projects are enterprise blockchain projects. Yeah. Um, but since I got involved with decentralized identity a couple of years ago, I, I've described it in, in, in a second way, and that's the superpowers it gives the individual. So it, it goes from being these multiple silos have a lot of data about me to I have now more control, more agency over the data about me, what it can be used for. Can you just touch on, you know, what are these superpowers that that the person gets when their bank is working in a self-sovereign identity model or their insurance company or their landlord? You know, I, I've used the example in the past of like, when you want to get an apartment in New York City, you have to show up with a folder full of information about you and hope they shred it when they're done. Like, can you talk a little bit about the individual and what self-sovereign identity or decentralized identity could mean to them? Sure. Um, so first, just to just to clarify on, on the enterprise side, um, I think a big, like in Europe, we're a European company, we have the, the GDPR, which is like privacy, um, um, a privacy law, which is pretty strict about uh, how to deal with a person, personal identifiable information. Um, so we see a lot of because there are serious consequences if you are not treating that data um, as a, like securely as you should, which if you think about it, like there are a lot of small web shops, et cetera, that just don't have the capacity to do that. Um, so a lot of parties, a lot of enterprise or smaller companies, they are, um, uh, yeah, they don't want that data anymore because now they have to deal with all that stuff around it. Um, and plus uh, another cool thing is is uh, the, the data because we have all this cryptographic assurance behind it um, you can be much more sure that the data you're presented with is actually correct um, and uh, the definition of correct is uh, is a whole nother philosophical uh, discussion I'm not gonna <laughs> kind of touch on but so for the individual itself um, I think it's a double-edged sword um, you get that control I think that's a very important one. Um, I think a lot of people right now, uh, you see sort of nihilism, I think, when it comes to privacy in a lot of people, uh, but with a lot of people, especially less technical people. They're like, yeah, but everybody, yeah, my, everybody knows every everything anyway about me. Well, yeah, that is because we ended up in this situation, but that doesn't have to be like that. Um, and I think that is something that decentralized identity can bring to the table. Um, and you spread like next to control you don't need to spread your data that much like now i have to um uh, give my birth date uh, uh, when i sign up to services websites whatever my email addresses are everywhere um i get about i think 40 emails that are just purely spam each day because i have spread my email address uh, so much and i was forced to um so in, in that sense, I do think it is um, interesting. And if you if you really look at the online use case, I think a very big win is um, a single credential login or at least less credentials. Because if you look at a username or email address uh, password model, if you want to do it securely, you have a use a unique password everywhere. Um, that means you need, if you want to do that, because you, you're going to have to manage a lot of credentials, you need to use a password manager not everyone is capable of doing that. Um, so in the end, everything is less secure. Um, I think that is a, 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 a incredible win for the, for the user in the end. It's just that it can lower uh, that barrier. There's one other side, I'd say, is with getting the control. Um, and this is something we are like, that is, that it's a difficult problem, but I think the whole community is actively working on it with getting back that control there's also responsibility um you have your credentials so you need to manage them like right now if i um lose my password somewhere i can just reset my password or, or something uh, similar um if you are managing all your credentials and you are the only one that is managing those credentials and you lose them or you make a mistake 
um, yeah, you have a problem. And this is it's it's just, it's comparable to the problem we've seen with private keys and and and, and crypto, right? Um, yeah. Very cool. Thank you for that. It's a great answer. Um, Let's get to the most important topic for today, which is Aries Framework JavaScript. Uh, Berend, what is Aries Framework JavaScript? Yeah, that is that is a good question. Um, so I'll, I'll just refer to it as AFJ um, to, <laughs> to keep it a bit quicker. Um, but AFJ started out as, well, I, I guess Karim would know it better how it started out exactly, but it, it started out as a as a framework that implemented the uh, Aries RFCs, which are created as a set of protocol specifications documents that everyone can follow the same set of rules. And we can all talk to each other, uh, all different Aries implementations. We have one in Python and Go and .NET and JavaScript, of course, and we want to talk to each other. So AFJ is a implementation of those specifications. Um, We've mainly been focusing on staying in uh, compatible with as many environments as possible. So we have um, we have environments for servers with, uh, with Node.js. Uh, we are fully working on um, mobile environments, or React Native, so all those uh, wallets uh, they they can run on AFJ. We also have, I think, it's two projects now running in Electron. Um, so we really want to like stay available for everyone, so that people with small teams, startups, um, have personal projects for as students, uh, you only need to, need to learn like JavaScript or TypeScript and you can get started with AFJ. Um, another main focus of course is the usability. We really want it to be as easy as possible to get started with it and to provide um, as many features as we can, um, which is uh, quite important to us. We've also recently uh, in the last couple of months, I think we've been working on basically extending beyond Aries. Uh, so we've been looking into open ID and uh, other credential formats so that we can be a more useful framework for more and more people. And to also like bridge the gap a bit between different kinds of protocols and different kinds of standards. Um, I, I, I think that that's a bit of a, Got it. Well, the answer to what is A to J. <laughs> that 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 is great, and we touched a little bit earlier on on why you contribute to AFJ. But you're both contributors to AFJ, Aries Framework JavaScript, but you also work for a company, um, Animo. And and does Animo have its own wallet built on AFJ? Like, is that is that part of what you're doing? Like, you're you're building in this open source community, but you also have your own products based on that open source project project. So, um, uh, yes, uh, um, yes and no, we have, we have built like we, when we started Animo, uh, the, the main mission was, um, because again, uh, as I touched upon earlier during the student project, we, 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 we started working with, uh, Aries, Aries Cloud Age Python. Um, and we noticed, okay, this is really hard. <laughs> like it is not easy. There are a lot of specifications, a lot of in-depth technical knowledge. And if you look at identity, it is everywhere. So we really chose Aries Framework JavaScript to just because it's one multi-platform, as 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 Berend just um, just mentioned, but because it is the it is still the widely the most widely used language out there. Um, so uh, over the years we have um, well worked on the framework itself, uh, mostly done client work. So we've built built a lot of wallets for others. Um, um, we've, uh, we've offered con consultancy um, and, and also worked on more backend like issuer and uh, and verifier uh, kind of stuff. And uh, about a year ago, we have started working on our own product, uh, which is called Paradigm, which is basically a um, um, a, a software as a service service um, where uh, where we try to really really abstract all the difficulties away so um you basically have a have a yaml configuration file where you can um configure your ssi flows um, um which is really extensible uh, and then next to that because um, the server side um is usually for the issuer and the verifier 
Um, so uh, alongside that, we are uh, launching um, also a wallet, which is called the Paradigm Wallet, which will be uh, in the App Store soon. Uh, but uh, and it has, we have built a lot of wallets before we started thinking about building our own. Brilliant. And, and the Paradigm Wallet, and this, the last time it was at animo.id, which is the website for your company, we are going to include the links to part of the, to all this discussion in the show notes. Um, there's a, a wait list now for Paradigm, correct? You're doing a, a pre-sign up before it's released? Well, um, I don't know when this is uh, being posted, but uh, Paradigm will be released tomorrow. Um, oh, which okay. is the first of September, so probably when the, when this podcast goes out, uh, it's, it's already, already there. It's Great. already there. Um, yeah, but people can visit paradigm.id um, for for the product um, or or animo.id for uh, for our our company website. Awesome. Um, you work on your own wallet. You work on a open source project for wallets and agents. You work on client work for folks who either on the issuer side or the verifier side. How important is interoperability to decentralized identity? And this is for either of you, anybody can pick this up. But um, initially when I got involved, interoperability was everything and the standards were gonna help with that and the, the build was gonna help with that and open source was gonna help with that. But what's your opinion on, on interop and how important that is to what an ecosystem that we're trying to build? Yeah, I mean, we are talking about identity, right? And identity is such a big topic. Like I touched uh, on the um, the passport example uh, earlier on, and if, if you think about it, like a physical passport is is it is it has been a very interoperable document for a long, long time. Not every passport is recognized everywhere. There are some countries that are not being recognized by others, but in general, it's a really interoperable document and. You don't want to have the situation where you cannot prove something about yourself purely because someone uses other technical standards. That would be a, yeah, that would not be very convenient. And there are a lot of um, credentials that, that, that require global recognition. If you think about um, maybe you have an American student that did their bachelor's in America and now wants to continue their master's in uh, Europe. Um, if those two... Uh, if those two continents used or, or countries use very different, um, yeah, standards uh, and, and they are not able to talk to each other, there we have a problem. Um, so you want to have this, um, this interoperability. But on the other side, it is also um, unlikely that the whole world will agree on one standard. So uh, because, I mean, also identity information is quite culturally um, um yeah, what's sensitive and 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 what is sensitive and how to handle certain things are really uh, dependent on on culture and on all kinds of other things. Um, so instead of looking at all agreeing on one standard, which I think the only standard that that, that ever achieved that is probably HTTP and maybe HTML. Um, um, it would be good if we have just a select few and then build bridges between those. But yes, extremely important. Right. Um, how does AFJ, not necessarily how does AFJ work, but how does a, what is the AFJ focus on interoperability? Like when, when y'all are being maintainers and you're working with new contributors or you're talking to companies that are thinking of using AFJ, um, what is the interoperability story you tell there? So, I mean, like, like what's Korea mentioned, it's extremely important and, and also for us because we, yeah, we we don't want our framework to be like like you have to use ten different kinds of frameworks and use them together, and then you can build a wallet that is interoperable in two countries. You want like you want like we choose the TypeScript or JavaScript because it's uh, use, usable everywhere. We also want AFJ to be usable everywhere, and so for Aries, um, like within Aries, we also kind of have interoperability profiles, um, which is mainly so we can talk. From Aries to Aries, which is, I mean, it's it's also still interop because we we want to talk with Akapai because we we want to talk with with issuers. Um, so with AFJ, we've also been focusing on that for quite a bit. Um, so getting to those, there I think there are two, and they're working on a third one, AIP one and AIP two. Uh, we've been working on getting those like like all the check marks uh, to to talk with other agents with that. Um, and Aries itself, I mean, the, the specification, it's, I mean, it comes from Hyperledger Indy and then from Aries, there's uh, Ditcom that is also separated out of it. 
So it's been a bit of a it's been a bit of a ride, um, but we now also want to or look into and have been developing on uh, support for non indie credentials or now anocrats, um, which will also again help with um, uh, interoperability. So if you get a credential issued in in format A, um, we can use like Divcom, which is more Aries, and we can prove it via open ID, but it will be the same credential. So within Aries, there has been quite a bit of interoperability also with other standards. And for AFJ specifically, um, like now what I said before, we've really been looking into going broader than just Aries, um, which <laughs> might go into a bit of a naming issue, uh, but we've been really been looking into like the EU and what well, they've been proposing with OpenID and with SDJWTs, uh, JSON-LD. Um, we've really been looking into supporting all of that. And we know that not everyone or not every country or every company will use the same standards. So we really want to provide a way for people to use AFJ however they want to use it. And that would mean like, okay, you, you want to support OpenID and you want to support... Uh, um, JSON LD credentials, but you you don't want Anoncrats for whatever reason, then you are free to do so and you can just take it out. You don't want to support open ID because you don't want to be uh, your your wallet shouldn't work in Europe, then leave it out. We we want our framework to be extremely modular so people can really fit it for their uh, use cases and for their uh, for the parties they want to be interoperable with and they don't want to like fill the app with features that, that people don't need and I have the app of 300 megabytes that that's going to take up your whole phone with everything that you don't want. Oh, that's an awesome answer. And that extensibility is so important, uh, which also makes this interview slightly more extensible because Berend mentioned uh, the European Digital Wallet Architecture Reference Framework, also known as the ARF. Um, Animo, your company recently announced making Aries Framework JavaScript a global framework. And this is something that I'd probably say is the most important thing y'all are working on right now. Can you describe, first of all, what is the ARF and, and, and your response as an organization, both to the ARF uh, with this program, but also your challenge to the Aries framework JavaScript community, like, hey, let's rally, let's, let's get something done here. So if you could start with just what is the ARF and what the ARF is asking for, and then what is this response in making Aries Framework JavaScript a global framework? Sure. Um, so the ARF is um, the European Union. So uh, it's it's a document uh, published by the uh, the um, European Commission. Um, I think it is correctly um, that uh, outlines basically their vision for the uh, the decentralized uh, identity ecosystem um, in Europe. So um, they have already announced like years and years ago that they want to get into this. And um, well, slowly uh, but steadily, they are, um, they are working on it. And this, this, uh, this document, the architecture reference framework is a reference framework for specifically wallets. Um, um, and it outlines um, the standards they will use. Um, so um, Berend already mentioned a few of those. Um, OpenID for uh, for VC, so that's OpenID for verifiable credentials, which is um, um, a a OpenID. Yeah, OpenID is a much broader uh, a much broader organization, I guess, instead of standards. Um, but this basically integrates verifiable credentials into into that. Um, but there is also the um, a, a different credential format, uh, which is um, called SDJWT, so like the disclosure for uh, JSON Web Token based credentials. Um, so that is what the architecture reference framework is in a nutshell. It's just a document that outlines, um, yeah, the standards that we we'll use and, and 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 requirements around identity information. Um, this effort um, um, that we have proposed so. Aries framework JavaScript is based on Aries standards, as, as Berend already described, and the standards that are outlined in the ARF are not Aries standards. So we basically have a um, um, a framework, and as a European company, you know, it's it's. I mean, we're the Aries framework JavaScript is still very relevant in in the US and in in Canada, but um, here it looks like. 
um, here in Europe, it looks like we're moving in a different direction. So our um, proposal, we have, we have basically proposed some work we are seeking funding for, um, is to add um, to add support for these for these um, for these standards um, to AFJ to Average Framework JavaScript, um, which which will make that framework. Um, yeah, it will, it will make it usable in the in the European Union, which is one thing, but also um, most, as I think, is, well, from what I see is most uh, solutions, frameworks, or um, yeah, SSI solutions out there, they are somewhat opinionated, so they make choices um, in, okay, we are going to support these standards, but these not, um, and that is usually quite... Um, yeah, it really depends on the jurisdiction you're in, if that if that makes sense, yes or no. We try to to not do that. Um, so by offering this, it's not only going to be usable in in the European Union, but it may also act as a bridge between different um, kinds of standards. So as uh, I think uh, Berend already touched uh, touched upon it, you could get a credential issued over Didcom and now present proof of it over OpenID or the other way around. Um, so that is um, that's the work we are proposing, and um, yeah, we want to get started. With that. And, and what does it entail? Um, you need to you have a fundraising component, but you also have a building component. Could you touch on each of those and talk about so what what's going into it? The fund well, we know how to do this because we are quite familiar with the framework uh, ourselves. Um, but and, and we'd like to do it, but we. We don't we don't have the money to put to put like um, months of work uh, to just invest months of work in, into that. Plus, there is a lot of other people that are also interested um, uh, that are using the framework and 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 my benefit from it. So the funding component there is just um, hey, we we know what to do. We've done some research. We think we have estimated it's going to cost us this amount of time. We've calculated that through to like an hourly hourly rate and. Um, and um, yeah, um, summed that together. So we are seeking funding for that, um, which would be great. And the building component is like if there are experienced either standards um, developers, so the, the, the people who work on the specifications themselves, um, there are still also some gaps there. So we are welcoming all kinds of contributions in that sense. Um, uh, or if there's a very experienced developer that, uh, or, or 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 someone who wants to just um, help a hand um, and get into and get into the framework and uh, and and well yeah, and contributing, then they are more than welcome. This is quite a uh, it's it's I wouldn't call this a um, good first issue, as they say on GitHub. It's it's it, it, because it is quite heavy standard work. Um, but yeah, we are welcoming. Um, all kinds of contributions in that regard. And it's, so, a, it's an interesting form of uh, funding open source in the sense that um, bc.gov has had a history over the years of doing code with us programs where the BC team needs a very specific feature. It's aligned with the roadmap and they're willing to put up funding for independent developers to step up and make those things happen. This is another, this is a, it's not the same. It's an interesting twist on, on what they're doing. And it's, it's actually quite cool. What's the timeline? Like what is, what is the the if not optimal the uh, schedule the the Aries Framework JavaScript team would like to see between funding and actually moving into development. So moving into development is um, it depends on funding, right? So uh, if I mean if we are not sort of sure that we at least we can get uh, a good portion of that funding, then it is hard for us to start. Um, I we have looked at like at just the whole time estimation. I think if um if we could start today, then uh it would take us well. I think if we if we play it safe, let's say end end of February to to get all the work in. Um, there has been some um uh, a few parties came forward and and have expressed their interest and and actually committed to funding. So um. The open ID package, uh, because there are basically four work packages. I don't know if I mentioned that before, but I'll quickly. Could you, could you go into a little detail on that? That'd be great. Yeah, sure. So um the the the, if the overarching uh, goal is to to make it compatible with the ARF, right? To implement all those standards. And if you look at that uh, at the requirements and standards, there we have 
um, divided them up into uh, what we call four work packages. So uh, one of those is um, the MDL mobile drivers license or MDOC standard, which um, the European Union, uh, but th th this is already used by uh, Apple, but Apple Wallet, for instance, the driver's license works uh, works with this. Uh, the European Union wants this for proximity um, uh, verification flows. So uh, if uh, if you're being stopped by a cop and you get the uh, registration and driver's license, please that um, that that you basically you can do it without an, in an active internet connection, but over Bluetooth or 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 NFC or something. So that is a different credential type, a different exchange protocol. Um, so we're bringing that to uh, Airstream with JavaScript. Then the ARF also. Um, requires you to um to use a uh hard, something that's called a hardware security module which is basically a little chip in your phone um that uh, contains a private key a cryptographic private key and you cannot get it out um because if uh, with cryptography how it works is if you have a private key then um yeah you have the master key so if if i steal baron's private key now i can pretend i am baron and that's not what you want so that's one of the requirements the other one is, um, as mentioned, like open ID for a verifiable credential. Um, I'd say uh, um, specification suite. They are the, the three major uh, specifications in that uh, in that suite, which is uh, open ID for verifiable credential issuance, which handles the issuance side. Then you have self issued open ID provider, which um, is is needed for the verification side of things, and then you have open ID for verifiable presentations it's a long breath um so those um those uh, three protocols will integrate and last but not least um a quite new um but very interesting standard uh, or credential format i should say is um sdjwt so um that is uh, selective disclosure for json web token based credentials and selective disclosure basically means if i have a credential that has five attributes in them my first name last name street name age and i don't know the the, the country i was born in whatever that i'm able to just disclose a few of those without breaking the cryptographic signature behind it so those are the 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 four work packages um we have divided it in, and so the last two, the OpenID um, suite work package and the SD uh, JWT work packages, they have already been uh, getting some interest, and we have had some funding commitments on that side. So we will actually start uh, that work um, next week, so from the first of uh, September. And for the other two, um, yeah, really depends on uh, on what the response, the community response is. Yeah. Awesome. And and we kind of already touched on how this is going to help the rest of the areas community. Everyone's going to learn from this work, period, full stop, but also how it's going to help the overall decentralized identity ecosystem. And more importantly, make Aries work within the EU under these new ARF guidelines. Um, maybe for Baron, how can individuals and companies get involved? If someone is interested in either being a funder or wants to raise their hand and say, I, myself and two of my friends would like to help build on this, like how do, how can, how can folks get engaged? So I, I think for for contributing to the packages or for for funding uh, directly, I think you can email my boss Kareem at animo.id. Um, I'm sure it will be will be linked somewhere. Um, for basically when it's finished, um, you can use it by installing AFJ. It's uh, npm install at Aries framework slash core, and then you can just use it um, right away and. If you install all the correct packages, you you should be good to go. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you so much. Yeah. So just to, go ahead. just to add that quickly because we have a um, we have a live document um, that's which is just a Google Doc document that's public um, and everybody can comment or make suggestions on that which outlines the work. I guess we can put that in the, in the that show will notes. be that will be in the show notes absolutely. Um, and please check out that document if you're interested in participating. Yeah, um, and there you find everything. Also, my contact information, um, the, the like the the estimated pricing uh, around around every work package, and and also if you uh, we've already had this like we the original draft uh, we made uh, there were parties interested, but they wanted to have a extra feature or just to extend it a little bit. So we are super open to that. So that document is definitely the place to be. Brilliant, and that's going to evolve over time, obviously, um, yeah. with the participation, which is really exciting. 
Um, let's talk a little bit about the future because we're coming close to time. Um, there's been a lot of activity in identity projects at Hyperledger this year. Anon Creds became a project at the end of 2022. Uh, Ursa moved to end of life. Ares is growing across not just AFJ, but also the other parts of Ares. There's tons of work going into Didcom, which makes me super happy because it's my favorite thing in decentralized identity, as everybody knows. I just don't, I don't want LinkedIn anymore and I don't want anybody between me and my connections anymore. Couldn't um, agree more. That, that's, my, that's my personal uh, thing. Um, but also the indie community is working on the future of indie. Uh, coming up in the next few weeks is going to be Indie Summit Part 2. What are your thoughts on the future? And this is going to be the, a huge question, but your thoughts on the future of, of Aries and just wallets in general? Like, where is Aries going? What is making you excited? And what's keeping you engaged? Um, well, that, that, yeah, that is a very, very, very good question. Um, I think Aries in general has a, has a, a good future. Um, I think it is still difficult for me to see where exactly it is going um, because we, we used to have like indie credentials, which is now separated to Anomcrats and like the indie SDK has been separated out. We have separated out Ditcon. And at some point, Aries will just be, or at least how I see it, um, mainly stole this from Timo, uh, but as a, a an interoperability profile for the Aries RFCs that we have. Um, so it will be a, how I see it, a, a set of standards um, and a group of those standards. And then you can say like, hey, I implemented this group of standards and now I can talk with, with these agents. Um, I think the the future of like the frameworks that that implement those standards will just just continue. Um, I think Ekapi is also um, looking into like uh, um, creating a more modular framework uh, and uh, doing a bit what what we've also been doing, like like separating uh, a couple of things out so you can pick and choose what you want. I think they're also interested in supporting more um, and looking broader than. Uh, what 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 we have been doing now, um, so it is a bit of a like a difficult question as well. Um, we've been looking into and, and talking internally uh, within the Aries community about where where the code should live. Uh, should it stay under Hyperledger? Should it stay under the Open Wallet Foundation? Um, and now yeah, there, the, I mean, the discussion is still going on. Uh, a lot of people have their opinion. Um, a lot of people are like, well, as long as we can contribute to code and as long as we can keep using it, it doesn't really matter to us. Uh, so I think someone has to has to make a decision. Um, I think for for us, it, it it we're a bit more I think in the boat of we as long as the code works, we're fine with it. Uh, we 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 love the code. We we love to work on it. And if it's under OWF or under Hyperledger, we'll just keep working on it and it will keep growing. Um, and then to 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 answer your last point about wallets, uh, I think that is a very difficult question. Um, I think in general, how I would like to see it at least is and where I think it's going is that at some point, most people will have a wallet. Um, but I do think that most people also won't really know they have a wallet. So maybe they will have to install it from their from their government or during some process and they will have it on their phone, but they will not scroll through it. They will not use it on a daily basis that they are aware of. I think seeing something like how the Apple wallet works for when you want to pay quickly, you, I mean, you know, you have the app, but I never opened that app in my life unless I just want to pay quickly. So I, I think it's almost a, like a guaranteed feature for future for wallets um, that people will have them. Um, but it will be important that we there will be a lot of uh, a lot of there will be regulation around it um, because we don't want a a party from a certain big tech company to create a wallet with specific standards uh, which no one uh, can talk uh, because they are uh, private standards and then we just have everyone use the same wallet and no one knows what is going on and you can't bring your own wallet, which is what we would like to do. So we're really hoping on a bit of regulation around that, that the uh, standards that 
wallet implementers will implement are open um, and we don't want like closed circles we want everyone to be able to talk to each other and we want everyone to be able to understand it and if you uh, are scared for any reason of, of a big tech company or a government that you can bring your own wallet which talks these same protocols and you can use that as long as it meets some regulation and guidelines so that's sort of, uh, <laughs> This really circles back around beautifully, I think, to your first uh, comment or somewhere at the beginning, Sean, like about Firefox, because I, I guess you want to go to a situation that is browser like where everybody like there's no, I, there are no websites where that I can only visit with Firefox. Right. Like, that I can, most most websites I can. I mean, Chrome is sometimes doing some funky stuff, but uh, in general, that's the thing. And um it's, I find it difficult because you want to have multiple, but you also don't want people to have to think too much about identity. Yeah. Um, and I think in the end, why do people choose Chrome versus Safari versus Firefox? It is UI mostly. I think UX um, just... Or, or in my case, because I put it on my mom's computer and I told her this is the one you want to <laughs> use and, and, and yeah. it updates and it keeps her safe. But at the same time, you know, you made a great point earlier, Kareem, about with great power comes great responsibility and, and having more control and having more agency gives you superpowers, which you then need to be responsible for. Um, thank you for that, Baron. That was a great, great answer. Let me ask if we only have a few minutes left. Um, what does the AFJ community need? Um, how can people get involved? Uh, what, what can folks, how, how, what do you need? What is, what is the AFJ community? If you, if you could wave a magic wand and have X tomorrow, what would X mean? I think the the main thing what we would like is like people to come to the working group calls and show their their usage of AFJ. Um, sometimes it, it it sort of feels like we're we're building things that that we would like to be in there, but we 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 miss a bit of uh, input from people that are using it. Um, and we would like to you know focus AFJ on like people are using it. What would you like then? we might be able to add it. We can put it on the roadmap. We can put a priority behind it. If we, you know, if we, if we, if we desperately want it, um, we want, I think, um, people to, to, of course, join the, join the discord. I think it's discord.com slash hyperledger or discord.gg because it's, you know, discord for gamers. Slash GG. <laughs> yeah. It, it's go. funny. Open, open source is, um, Anyone can use it. Anyone can modify it. Anyone can share it, which also means no one has to tell you when they're using it. And so we routinely at Hyperledger find out, oh, there's a bank in this Southeast Asian country that's implemented X. Well, they didn't have to ask permission. They just did it. And yeah. it is a frustration. It's a wonderful frustration because there are people using your product. But as an X product manager, I want the feedback of what happened. Like how easy was the onboarding? Where were the the friction or the pain points in you know doing the inst just the installation itself? Um, what what is your wish list for features? If you guys don't tell us, we can't add them. So yes, um, if you are using Aries Framework JavaScript, please join the call or at least join the Discord and let folks know what your experience has been. Let the team who's building this stuff know. Here's what we need. Um, it it's it's it it is awesome in the fact that anyone can use it, and it's also uh frustrating in that you don't always get feedback and i absolutely respect that baron that's great um one last set of questions where can we find out more about animo um our website is a great st place to start i guess um that's animo.id um so I think I think that's a and that's a good I mean we're we're obviously also on Twitter and 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 LinkedIn um uh, paradigm as as was previously mentioned or yeah x i have to say thank you for correcting me there uh i think in my phone it still says twitter but it has the x logo it's very confusing, very confusing. um uh, paradigm as i previously mentioned is the uh, is, a, is a product we're launching um uh tomorrow as of this recording um which uh which is paradigm.id you can go there um Feel free to contact us at any time. Um, if you want to know more, we're happy to chat always with people that are interested to get into the community. Um, yeah. And we will include links to all this in the show notes. Um, your work, Kareem, where can people find out more about you? 
do you have a blog or is there a I have a, no I don't have a personal blog we have a we have little um, well I mean I think in the last two months I wrote two for 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 hyperledger for you guys so so check that check out the hyperledger blog um um, Kareem has written two fantastic blog posts for Hyperledger, one previously on Aries Framework JavaScript 0.4.0 release, which came out in June. And yep. most recently, to coincide with this podcast, he wrote a, a blog post about making Aries Framework JavaScript a global framework, and that will be released shortly. Um, but you well, personally, you personally, Kareem, not not the blog. I have, a, I, I, I have a Twitter account I barely use, but I am committed to using it more. That was my last year's uh, resolution, and it will become my ex. You're right. I'm sorry, and it will become my uh, my next year's resolution probably. That is at, and I'm pretty proud of this at SSI underscore Kareem. So Good. Ex excellent uh, Twitter handle there, Baron. Where can folks find out more about you? You're muted, buddy. Ah, yes. <laughs> I also have a, a Twitter or X or I don't know how to call it now account, uh, but I don't use it. My resolution also is not to use it. So that's probably not the best place. Yeah, my GitHub, um, it's uh, Beren Sidrecht, but I think a link would be a lot better than me saying it in Dutch. <laughs> awesome. We will, we will make sure to include the link there. And making Aries Framework JavaScript a global framework, which is part of what we were talking about today, we're going to have a link to the initial blog post that was written on the Animo.id site. We're also going to link to uh, Kareem's blog post on the Hyperledger site as well. Um, and if folks want to find out more, they can check out those two resources or they can check out the uh, Discord. Um, there is an Aries Framework JavaScript channel underneath the overall Aries project. You can't miss it. And that's where all the action in AFJ is happening. Um, I would like to thank both Baron and Kareem for joining us today. Uh, this has been a fantastic discussion. We went a little bit longer than I thought. Um, but it was absolutely worth it. And uh, we look forward to seeing more from the AFJ Aries Framework JavaScript team. Thank you, Kareem. Thank you, Baron. Thank you so much. Thank you.